Hello, BookTube. We're continuing on today with uh, the read-along that I'm doing with David Murphy over on his channel. We are doing a chapter-a-day read-along of Christopher Hitchens best-selling book, God is Not Great. We're doing one chapter every weekday and then taking the weekends off. So we're on chapter five today, and then you'll have the weekend to yourself. <laughs> uh, and uh, quite a few of you have mentioned to me, you've, you've mentioned in the comments and also reached out via email. Keep in mind, my email is st period Donahue at gmail. Email me about anything you like. Uh, quite a few of you have pointed out uh, that you really don't think God is not great. I've mentioned a few times that it was the best selling of the wave of new atheist books that came out about 10 years ago. And quite a few of you have, have questioned whether or not that's true. Mentioned that you, you go to bookstores, you go to, you know, great books or interesting book displays in bookstores, and you see The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins, but you don't see God is not great. Uh, and I want to say two things about that. One, of course that is correct. That is a very good catch. What I meant is the best-selling book when these books were new, when they were a year or two old, when all these things were new, when they were all on everybody's lips, when they were all in the bookstores in new release sections, God is not great sold far more than any of the others or all of them put together. But the, the observation about the God delusion is entirely correct. That book has what we call legs. It sold really well at the time, but it is the only one of the four that I'm thinking of that have that has continued to sell well, and I believe will continue to sell well for all time. I think God is not great. The phenomenon of the book was largely uh, born aloft by the phenomenon of Christopher Hitchens himself, and when he wasn't around to keep it alive, I, I think a great deal of wind was taken out of its sails. So that observation number one is that 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 point is very true. The, the long-term uh, palm of victory here goes to the God delusion. And observation that I have, uh, number two, that I have about those comments is, um, folks, uh, keep in mind, Steve is always right, okay? What kind of dear leader cult of personality are we running here if you people can't even get straight that you must never disagree with me? <laughs> You're hopeless, hopeless, as Jonestown-style zombie-eyed followers, hopeless. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we are now on chapter five of this book, and it is titled, The Metaphysical Claims of Religion Are False. Uh, and you might think from that title that what is going to follow is Christopher Hitchens examining the metaphysical claims of religion and proving them false. <laughs> you, will, you will think that at the very least. But actually, a good title for this book would be The Metaphysical Claims of Religion Are Not Examined. <laughs> It's not that they're, they're true or false. They're obviously false. But they're not given a, a, even a cursory walk around the block in this chapter. Uh, instead, this chapter is Hitchens resorting to something that is very familiar to him, which I believe the Brits call tub thumping, uh, where he just goes on a riff, then winds it down, goes on another riff, then winds it down, goes on another riff, and then winds it down. He almost doesn't talk about the metaphysical claims of religion. And I shudder to think of the young men out there in the in the manosphere. <laughs> I shudder to think of the young men out there in the manosphere. I shudder to think of them anyway, under any circumstance, but I shudder to think of them thinking that this chapter represents a metaphysical discussion of anything. And I know that some of them do. I've met I've met some of those young men who just think that Hitchens walked on water, that, that he was the smartest, sharpest person in the world. He was extremely smart and extremely sharp. And also, as David has pointed out in a couple of his videos, and you know, I should point out as well, uh, we are being harsh on this book because it was so popular, because it has wormed its way into so many uh, tiny libraries of dude bros who don't read any or don't read much else. This and Jordan Peterson are on the same shelf all the time. Uh, we're tough on the book because of that, and also because, <laughs> because I suspect, I've never met David Murphy, but I suspect that he has something that I, I, I've, uh, I've long wondered isn't maybe a genetic component of Irish Americans, which is that we don't like anybody getting on their high horse <laughs> with us at all. <laughs> we, uh, the Irish Americans tend to, to, uh, to excel in being a kind of feral intellect. <laughs> I'm not a good example of that. I was a feral intellect, and then I fell into the hands of the Jesuits, and the Jesuits excel in taking feral intellects and making something weaponized out of them. <laughs> uh, but it's something in that tone that also makes us want to criticize every single sentence of this book, at least for me. That bit that I read you about attending agreeable conferences, 
makes me want to not only want to deconstruct every sentence in this book, but dig Christopher Hitchens up and belt him across the face. <laughs> but uh, but uh, although there isn't any discussion, much less demolition, of religion's metaphysical claims in this chapter, I don't know. Maybe David will find some. <laughs> I, I have no idea. It's been it's been a delight to do a read along this way. I don't think anyone else in Booktube history has ever done a read along this way where we are doing essentially a detente read along. We are we are on parallel tracks, but our ambassadors are not meeting. It's not like we're let's not we're chatting over Voxer every day and organizing what we're going to say and what we're going to do. They were, his videos are all surprises to me, finding out what he picks out of each thing, which thing he finds interesting. And in a couple of his recent videos he has wanted to stress the fact that despite the fact that we are uh, again, as the Brits would say, taking the piss out of this at every available opportunity, Hitchens can still be great. I mean, that's the animating the animating factor of this book, is that when he is great, he is great. He had a way with language. I myself think that it isn't as obvious in this book as it is in quite a bit else that he wrote, but even here, when he is on, he is really on. And I want to read you a slightly long passage from this chapter to underscore that fact, because uh, nothing in this chapter is original. Uh, again, I've mentioned Robert Ingersoll. I keep mentioning Robert Ingersoll. I wish we had a Robert Ingersoll book in print today. That would be wonderful. Uh, I keep mentioning him. There are a whole bunch of other people that I could mention uh, who have made these arguments better. Uh, new atheists uh, on YouTube and elsewhere have often complained that, that religious apologists, especially Christian apologists, really don't have anything new to say. They don't come up with new arguments. They just continually shuffle around the same small handful of old arguments. Uh, and they don't like to admit it, but the same thing is true of of the new atheists. There's only this. This is a very limited discussion. I believe that it is fundamentally limited at its core by the very thing that I was mentioning uh, a couple of videos ago, which is that none. Obviously, none of this is anything. None of this means anything. None of it is true. Obviously, none of this is true. Snails in your garden have personalities, rudimentary ones but personalities. Some of them will come straight towards your finger. Some of them will back away. Some of them will go straight towards each other. Some of them will back away. They're not identical. They're not machines. They're not biological machines. They have rudimentary personalities. There, there are, despite having almost nothing in the way of biological cognition. I'm sure that if you talk to people who have pet snakes, Snakes, they have a, a singular mystical allure, but they are extremely simple creatures. And their cognitive center is as big as a marble, at most, <laughs> at most as big as a marble. I've seen people who have pet garden snakes, who have, I, I generously call it a brain, it's the size of a, of a sesame seed. And those things, those creatures as well, I have spent time with them. Once their owners absolutely assured me that they cannot bite, I, I've spent time with these animals, and you, there is a discernible personality. There very much is a discernible personality. And that's to say nothing of once you get up to cognitive complexity. Bats, most birds, uh, dogs, cats, pigs, goats, horses, dolphins, and then our great ape cousins. Once you get up into, into uh, you know, relatively speaking, gigantic biological organisms like that, where the cognitive center has to be complex because it's dealing with so much, once you get up that far, there is absolutely, if, you, if you're not completely prejudiced, if you're not saying brain-damaged animals at a zoo, for instance, if you meet these people on their own terms in a relaxed environment in which they are not afraid of you, you see immediately that they are every bit what humans are, only without gods. <laughs> they don't have gods. The only species that could think up this concept is the only one that did. And that buries the concept as far as I'm concerned. And I think that explains why the discussion feels so bottled. It is such a bottled discussion. Even a really good new atheist, even a really good anti-apologist, like Hitchens can be, will only be good by virtue of eloquence. They won't be good by breaking any new ground at all. Uh, but I want to read you an eloquent passage, a bit long, but you'll have to indulge me because I was a bit harsh on him in the last chapter. Uh, and this is really good. It has nothing to do with the metaphysical claims of religion, but it's still really good. Uh, the decay and collapse and discredit of God worship does not begin at any dramatic moment. 
such as Nietzsche's histrionic and self-contradictory pronouncement that God was dead. Nietzsche could no more have known this or made the assumption that God had ever been alive than a priest or witch doctor could ever declare that he knew God's will. Rather, the end of God worship discloses itself at the moment which is something more gradually revealed when it becomes optional or only one among many possible beliefs. That is a brilliant observation. Yes, and that is why uh, adolescents tend to lose their religion when they go to college, because suddenly it's optional. Suddenly there's no family making them go to church. Suddenly there's no uniformity of expression. Suddenly they're surrounded by people who have different beliefs or none at all. And suddenly their own belief becomes optional. They don't have to go to church anymore on Sunday. And that ends up killing their belief. That's a fantastic observation. Uh, for the greater part of human existence, it must always be stressed. This option did not really exist. We know from the many fragments of their burned and mutilated texts and confessions that there were always humans who, who were unconvinced. But from the time of Socrates, who was condemned to death for the spreading of unwholesome skepticism, it was considered ill-advised to emulate his example. A little bit wonky there. Uh, Socrates, there, is, there is no accurate stretch of the imagination that can say that Socrates was put to death for questioning religion. <laughs> he was put to death for a few reasons, one of which was quasi-religious, but not for... But anyway, I, you get the point. Uh, except the, the only thing that isn't good about that wobbly little example there is that Hitchens is drawing a comparison between himself and Socrates. It's like the 150th example where he does that in the course of this book, but <laughs> even so. Uh, and for, the, for billions of people down the ages, the question simply did not come up. The votaries of Baron Samedi in Haiti enjoyed the same monopoly, founded upon the same brute coercion, as did those of John Calvin in Geneva or Massachusetts. I select these examples because they are yesterday in terms of human time. Many religions now come for us with ingratiating smirks and outspread hands, like an unctuous merchant in a bazaar. They offer consolation and solidarity and uplift, competing as they do in the marketplace. But we have a right to remember how barbarically they behaved when they were strong and were making an offer that people could not refuse. That is very good, uh, and I, I love passages like that. They are the passages that I have most lovingly uh, underlined in my copy of God is Not Great. Uh, but, and the only repo repost that I would have to that, I love the passage. I wanted to share it with you. Uh, this will be a relatively short video. There's no reason why every one of these chapter-a-day videos has to be 30 minutes. The only counterpoint that I would make to the observation there is one that David brought up in a couple of his videos. He, wants, he wanted to remind you that religions are organizations. Now, you can say that they're inspired by God. Hitchens says all throughout this book that they are man-made. Okay, fine. But organizations behave as organizations do, and they don't behave noticeably different, whether they're religious or non-religious. So that observation that, that when religions ha had uncontested social power, they could, react, they could act barbarously and tyrannically, applies across the board to organizations. <laughs> any, or virtually any organization that has complete uncontested power over people will start to behave in barbaric ways. Virtually any of them will, and a lot of the ways they behave will be identical to the ways that religions behave, which fundamentally undercuts the contention that religion poisons everything. There's something else going on here that Hitchens just isn't looking at. He knew it perfectly well. Let's, let's keep that clear. He did not believe half of the, the prestidigitation that he does in this book. He had traveled too widely and was too versed in current political scenes to believe that it was sole and only religion that was doing this stuff and that it was the only thing that ever did. Nevertheless, that, that observation is put really well. And he repeated it ad nauseum whenever he had a chance that we mustn't forget how religion behaved when it ruled the world, when it had no competition. That, it's, it's a little bit of a simplistic position. Religion was virtually never uncontested, even in the situations that he described, in the locations that he described. It was virtually never uncontested. And a lot of the, the things that contested with it, the other organizations that contested with it, behaved much as it did, without claiming divine intervention. So uh, we're, that's going to wrap up my observations on the metaphysical claims of religion are not present in this chapter. <laughs> and we're going to move on. We'll move on on Monday. Uh, to the next chapter, which is a humdinger. So I want I want to prepare you because I, some, one of the impressions that David and I both might be giving you 
about this book is it's not worth you reading. It is worth you reading. Uh, and uh, I, in my opinion, chapter six is a standout example of why. So chapter six is called Arguments from Design, and we will do that on Monday. <laughs> so we are going to take a break from Hitch Along until Monday. <laughs> so I will see you then. <laughs> Thank you, book two.